Good morning, everybody. This is Brenda Grills with Handy Quilter. My clock shows 11 o'clock, but I can see that a number of the folks who registered for this webinar have not yet signed in. I'm going to give them a couple of minutes, so please hang in with us, and we'll be with you shortly. Good morning, everybody. This is Brenda Grills with Handy Quilter. My clock shows about two minutes after 11. I've still got people coming on fast and furious, so I'm going to give them a few more minutes to get settled, and then we'll begin. Well, one good morning again, folks, one more time. This is Brenda Grells. I'm the Director of Marketing and Education for Handy Quilter, and we are so excited to be here today, and we want to thank you for joining us for our very first Handy Quilter Education webinar. Today our topic is TNT, Threads, Needles, and Tension, and we have in the studio with us today one of our studio educators, Cheryl Duncan. She's going to be presenting the information and she's available here to answer your questions. Good morning, Cheryl. Good morning, Brenda. Thanks for inviting me. I'm going to run the slide, Cheryl, and let you just start talking. So here we go, folks. Hang on to your hats. Okay. Today we're going to be talking about threads, needles, and tension. And the, the best part, to, best place to start is with the needle. The parts of the needle are the shank. And on the quilting needles, the shank is round. It's on domestic machines, it is a flat shank. And so it's really easy to make sure that that needle goes in the correct position. With the domestic machine, the shank is cut away about a third. On the quilting machines, we have a round shank. And the reason that we have a round shank is that machines move at such a high rate of speed that we need that extra strength. You want to make sure that your shank is all the way in the top of your machine when you're putting it in. The groove is the long indentation on the front of the needle. The groove is there to protect the thread and to help keep it from shredding. If your needle is not the correct size for the thread and the thread doesn't fit properly in the groove, you're going to get shredding. You want to make sure that your needle is the correct size for the thread that you are using. So Cheryl, that looks like an awfully big needle. 
How can we cut such a big needle here? Is that the size our machine uses? Actually, we use that in the studio during retreat to keep our people awake. It's actually for demonstration purposes only. And I don't know of a machine that that would, that would fit in. You want to make sure that you choose the right size needle for your weight of thread so that that thread will fit nicely in the groove. If you have a thicker thread, you're going to need a thicker needle. Carol, I've got a, a silly question. If I have a really thin thread with a great big needle, will that work? It will work, Brenda, but the only thing is, is that you will have a bigger hole on your quilt. I would like to use the needle that's a smaller needle so I have a smaller hole. However, when you wash the quilt, that hole's going to disappear anyway. The eye of the needle is what holds the thread. Sometimes, if your eye is too small, you're going to have a hard time threading that needle, and so you need to move up to a larger size needle. It's not always that we're losing our eyesight and we can't see that hole when we have to trouble threading it. It's because our thread is too big. I think I could thread this one even without my reading glasses. I do too, and I wish that was how big it was on my machine. <laughs> the back of the needle is the scarf. It's the cutout portion that the hook passes through in order to form the stitch. If that's turned around to the front of the machine, the hook has nowhere to go to catch that thread, and so you're not going to get a properly formed stitch if you get a stitch at all. So you want to make sure that that scarf is in the back of your, facing the back of your machine. You want to make sure that you have the groove to the front and the scarf to the back in order to form your perfect stitch. With the scarf at the back, you're able to form that loop and make your stitch. As the needle enters the fabric, it's carried along the groove, and part of the purpose of the groove is to protect that thread the needle goes up and down many times before that thread actually lands in the fabric. When this so Cheryl, something that always intrigues me is just how that stitch is formed. So you said the thread goes down in the groove, and now that thread's way down below the fabric. What happens next? When the thread is down below the fabric, the hook actually passes between the, sh the scarf on the needle and the loop of thread that is made, and that catches that loop of thread, and together it creates a friction that holds that thread next to the fabric. So that fabric doesn't allow the thread to come back up with the needle. It friction holds it down there, huh? Correct. So that's how that loop forms? Yes, that is. Okay, and the loop's important. Why? You have to have that loop for the hook to pass by so that the bobbin thread can be caught in the top thread. It's very important on the handy quilting, quilting machines that your needle is put all the way up to the top. On the side of the needle bar, we actually have a sight hole that you can look through. If you have a question as to whether your needle is all the way up in there, you can look through there. If you can see the top of your needle, then you know that it's all the way up. However, sometimes if you have a needle break, Sometimes it'll break off and that top of that needle will still stay up in there. And so then you've got to very carefully get that top out so that your new needle will fit all the way up in. You know, Cheryl, we have uh, folks here that answer questions from people that are having trouble. And I know I've heard stories about consumers who didn't get that needle all the way up. What, what, what happens to your stitch if the needle's not all the way up there? A lot of times, if your needle is not all the way up there, it won't even make a full revolution because it'll actually hit the hook, not allowing the needle to go all the way down into the fabric. Wow. I bet that's noisy. It's not only noisy, but it can cause timing problems in the future, too. You want to make sure that your needle is positioned properly, and an easy way to do this is to put your needle in, making sure that it's all the way up to the top, using a pin you can put it in the eye of the needle and adjust where the needle position is. The perfect place would be with the needle facing 6 o'clock. So if I'm standing in front of the quilting uh, machine, I'm at the 6 o'clock position? Correct. You're at the 6 o'clock position, and that's where you want your needle to face. You know, I think I've seen you replace a needle in a machine before, and then you used that old needle instead of a pin, didn't you? I have. You can use your old needle. Just make sure that you put the new needle in first and then use the old needle and don't get the two needles mixed up. <laughs> well, there's our first tip of the day. I like the fact that this pin can be used like a little lever 
to adjust that eye of the needle. It, it's so much easier than trying to hang on to the needle with my big fat fingers. It is, and it makes it more accurate too that you can get a six o'clock position. Sometimes if you're experiencing skip stitches, if you will actually rotate the needle slightly towards the 630 position, it will solve the problem. That way your thread is able to catch the loop sooner. So you don't have to have it at the 6 o'clock. That's ideal, but if you're having troubles, you can adjust it a little bit, huh? You can. You don't want to adjust it a lot. You want to just make it a slight adjustment. Then if you're having shredding problems, you can rotate that needle slightly towards 530. That will make the time delay so that the hook grabs the thread later, and that will help prevent your shredding issues. This doesn't always help with every thread, but some of the threads need to be changed just slightly. And what you're actually doing when you're rotating the needle, Brenda, is you're actually adjusting your timing. Wow, I didn't know I could do that. You can. Cool. With a handy quilter, with sewing machine needles, they come in an American type and a European type. Well, actually, I think the needles are the same kind. They just have different numbering systems. Have you ever been confused by that? Yes, I have. You know, I, I, I found this little chart to share with everybody because sometimes when I buy machine needles for my domestic machine, I don't know what a 70 is versus a 14. But you can see the equivalence here. Uh, an American size 14 is the same as a European size 90. That's really good to know, Brenda. And here's something else that's kind of cool and confusing all at the same time. Do you see how quilting and sewing machine needles go from small to large and the numbers go from small to large too? So a 9, for example, is smaller than an 18? Yes. Take a look at this. When you go to hand needles, it's just the opposite. Here, a small number is a big needle, and the big numbers are small needles. Are you confused yet? I am. Why can't I just do it all the same? I think it's because somebody about 300 years ago made these decisions for us. We'll just have to live with it, won't we? So Handy Quilter sells several different sizes of needles. you want to tell us about that? We do. We sell several different sizes of needles. We have a size 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20. And depending upon the thread, will determine the size of needle that you want to use. That number 125 there, that refers to the European size that's the equivalent of the American size 20. Thanks, Brenda. You want to make sure that as you're purchasing needles, that you use the right needle system. The Handy Quilter uses the 134, or, and it's a 135 by 7 system. Take a look at that label on that needle package. Do you see the 134 and right underneath that it says DP times 5, 135 times 5, and so forth? All of those are different names for different needle systems, and they're all a name for this very same needle. So you can use any of those needle systems in our machines, but you've got to make sure you've got the right system. So probably the easiest way to make sure that you get the right needle system is to actually get your needles from a handy quilter dealer, right? What a good idea. Now, contrary to what some people believe, the length of the needle is not important. Um, a lot of times folks will say, oh, I know why the timing was wrong on my machine. I had a needle that was way too long because when I used that shorter needle, everything worked fine. Actually, that's not true at all. A size 20 needle will always be longer than a size 12 needle because a 20 is bigger, and as it gets bigger in diameter, it gets bigger, longer in length. What's important, and this is what the needle system does, is the distance from the top of the needle, which they call it the butt. I don't know why the butt is the top, but that's what they call it. So the dif distance between the butt of the shank and then the top of the eye. If you think about that, that rotary hook doesn't change its position. It's always revolving in the same place. So it always needs to engage with the loop at the same place, and that's at the top of the eye. That's where your thread is. So in a needle system, regardless of the size of the needle, that distance between the butt and the top of the eye will be consistent. 
That's interesting, Brenda. That's and, more about needles than I ever knew. And it's more than I knew, too, until I got to Handy Quilter and our engineers explained it to me. But it makes sense. This is why you can't go to a fabric store and buy, uh, well, for example, Schmetz. Schmetz needles are great needles. I use them in my domestic machine all the time. But you can't use them in our machines, the Handy Quilter machines. You've got to have the right system if you expect to have good results. That's true. You need the right needle. So why in the world do you need all these different size needles anyway? Brenda, there are so many different threads out there. It used to be that there were only a few threads. But anymore, there are so many threads out there. And they come in different weights and different plies. And so we need to have our needles fit the different threads. I'm not going to be able to fit a heavy thread through a size 12 needle so I need a larger needle to fit those heavier threads. You want to make sure that you're using the proper needle for the, proper, for the thread that you're using. Now I know we're going to get into this a little bit more in the next slides, but here's another one of those confusing things. We are so, our, our quilting machine needles get bigger as the numbers get bigger, but with threads it's the opposite, isn't it? It is, and I have a real easy way for you to remember that, Brenda. Oh, just think of it that this is an approximation, but 60 pounds of thread for a 60 weight thread, 60 miles of thread, excuse me, equals one pound of thread. So a 12 weight thread, 12 miles of thread would equal one pound. Oh, because it's bigger. Yeah. So you don't need as you don't need as much length to equal the same weight. Correct. Oh. So I can kind of envision that like I'm looping all that thread like into a bushel basket. So with a bigger, thicker thread, it wouldn't take as much thread to fill that up, would it? No, it wouldn't. But like a hundred or a ninety weight thread, something really fine, it would take lots and lots. So it would be a bigger number. Correct. Why? Do you think we've confused them now? I think so. <laughs> So there's lots of different threads, and it depends on the type of thread. 19 weight threads come in polyester and cotton, and when you want to use a you want to use a heavy thread when you want your quilting to show off. I know I did a quilt, and I wanted writing around the outside of my quilt. Well, if I'd used a fine thread, it wouldn't have shown up, but I used a heavy thread, and it showed up really nice. So 40 weight threads are like King Tut. Superior's King Tut and YLI's machine quilting threads, and some of your embroidery threads. They're a little bit heavier, but they're still finer than those heavy threads that we want to use to show off our quilting. So a, a big heavy thread will give us a bold quilting statement. It will. It will show off. One thing that we've heard a lot is that people say all the time, my machine only likes King Tut thread. And I think the reason that they say that is that King Tut is a little heavier thread, so it's a little bit easier to adjust the tension, and they don't have as much problem with it breaking. Well, I know one thing about handy quilter quilting machines. They like all kinds of threads. We do, and I'm so glad because you can't always get the color of thread that you like in one line of thread. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. I'll bet you you're going to help them figure out how to use all those different kinds of threads, aren't you? We are. So a 50 weight cotton and polyester threads work really well for micro, micro quilting as well as your basic quilting. And the reason that is is that they're a finer thread and so you're going to see more of the texturing than all of that thread laying on the top of your quilt. That would be especially true if I chose a thread the same color as my fabric, right? Correct. And I'm just sitting here thinking 50. That's a bigger number so that means my thread is finer. Correct, it is. It's a lot finer than a size 19. And now here's a we have, bigger number. <laughs> here's an even bigger number. It's a 60 weight bottom line. And it is what is usually on their pre-wound bobbins. But it also works great in the top of our machine for micro quilting. You know, I'm glad you mentioned those pre-wound bobbins because we don't have a slide. We, we weren't planning to talk about it today. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you like to use pre-wound bobbins with your machine? I do like to use the pre-wound bobbins. It's a real convenient way to have my bobbin already wound for me. I don't have to wind it, and it's already there. So here's the big question. Cardboard sides on or off? 
that totally depends on the machine. I would leave them on unless they're creating a problem. And sometimes if the sides of the cardboard get bent or they get oil in them, the oil will actually make that cardboard expand a little bit, then I would maybe take it off. But in most cases, I would leave it on. If you're having problems with that pre-wound bobbin, then you could wind it off of your bobbin and put it onto a metal bobbin and not waste your thread. Oh, that's a great idea. You know, Cheryl, sometimes I get to go to different quilt shows and work in the booth and demonstrate these machines to people. And I found that when I'm in a humid area, as opposed to the nice dry climate we have here in Utah, that sometimes that affects those pre-wound bobbins with the cardboard sides. That's because of the moisture. So what's it doing to the cardboard? It's actually expanding the cardboard because it's that moisture is soaking into the cardboard and expanding it. So in that case, you would probably want to either remove the cardboard on one side, and you want to remove it on the side that is outside, not facing the bobbin. Oh, you want to leave the cardboard on the side that's on the inside of the bobbin. Got it. Here's a big number. This is silk thread. It's a number 100. It is an extremely fine thread. It actually kind of melts into the background of your quilt, but it really looks nice. It's a little bit pricier than the other threads, but we like it a lot, don't we? We do. It is, and so you save it for those special occasions, for those special quilts. Now we have our monopoly and our nylon monofilament threads. These threads are really good for adding texture without adding color. If you've got a quilt that is several different colors and you know that your thread is going to show up a lot on one color and not so much on another color and you don't really want that, use your monopoly threads and that way you're going to see the texture and you're not going to see the color of the thread. So if I've got a red and white piece quilt and I want to do an edge-to-edge -edge design, you would recommend a monopoly or a monofilament nylon thread? I would. I use it all the time and I love it. I also like it for stitching the ditch. I have noticed, though, that those monopoly and monofilament threads come in two different colors. One they call smoke, and it's darker than this one we're showing on the screen. It does, and the reason it does is that with a dark fabric, if your quilt is all dark, the clear monopoly actually leaves a little bit of a shine to it, where if you use the smoke, it blends into the background and you just see the texture. However, I wouldn't use the smoke on a white fabric or a light-colored fabric because it's going to look dingy. Oh, I'll bet it would. The metallics and the glitter threads are great for adding that extra sparkle to your quilt. I really don't know that I'd want to put them in an heirloom quilt, but if I was doing a quilt for Christmas and I had Santa Claus's beard and I wanted that sparkle in there, or fireworks for the 4th of July, these are a great thread to put that sparkle and that little extra bling into your quilt. They might not be your best choice for a baby quilt, right? Correct. Something that's going to be used a lot like that, I'd want to make sure that I have a good solid thread because these are a very delicate thread. So sometimes I find threads that are just beautiful, but there's no way I could get them through even the biggest needle. Well, Brenda, then we have a trick that you can use. You can actually use them in your bobbin. You actually wind them by hand onto the bobbin or wind them with a bobbin winder slowly. You don't want to overwind them and you don't want to do it too fast because you don't want to stretch those threads. To do the bobbin work with your handy quilter, luckily we have the Velcro leaders. And so once you've got your quilt quilted and you know the area that you are able to, you want to put your um, decorative thread on, you just flip those leaders over and you actually quilt with your thread in the bobbin case, and you restitch over the same area again. So I watched my friend Kathy do the bobbin work on this quilt. You can see the K for her name, Kathy. Mm -hmm. And I know that that K was outlined first with a finer thread. So she did that from the top, and then she turned it over upside down, and she could see the K on the back side, and that's when she did that bobbin work, right? Correct. So I really like the way that that bobbin thread just lays on top. And uh, we're not really trying to pull it into the sandwich, are we? No, you don't want to pull it into your sandwich. And 
you probably wouldn't really be able to pull it completely in to meet into the middle like your other threads. You want to make sure that you loosen your bobbin case. And I recommend about a half a turn. And I always recommend that people loosen this over top of their quilt. Because if you drop that needle onto your carpet, or that screw on the top of your carpet. Or that little teeny tiny screw. That little teeny tiny screw. If you drop it onto your carpet, it's extremely hard to find. However, if you loosen it over top of your quilt and it falls out, it's right there and you can find it and put it back in again. You want to make sure that when you put this heavier thread in your bobbin, that you still have a correct tension. However, you're not able to do the normal drop test with this thread. So you want to set it in your hand and just pull it out. And you want it to pull out smoothly, but not have any drag on it as it's pulling out. That way, your thread is in the bobbin, your heavy thread is in the bobbin, and your top thread is going to come along and it's just going to catch that thread and hold it next to the fabric. So it will actually lay on top of your fabric. I'm really glad to learn there's a way to use those cool threads. It is. It's a lot of fun. It adds a lot of extra sparkle to your quilts. So Cheryl, tell me about threading this machine. What do I need to know? We don't have a picture of it right now, but you're going to place your cone of thread on your uh, thread holder at the back of your machine. That's on top of that little pod, right? I think they, sometimes they call it the P pod or the power pod. Correct. Or so it's the C pod or the computer pod. The C pod. Yeah. The computer the pod. The P pod's the other side, right? That's right. Okay. And so after it's on your C pod, you're going to go up through your thread mask. There is a thread guide on top of the machine that you're going to go into. And then you come to your three-hole tensioner. This is one area that people get confused on. You want to start at the top, and you always want to thread the thread from the back to the front. Wrap the thread around, go from the back to the front. Wrap the thread around, go from the back to the front. It's kind of like a barber pole, isn't it? It is. After that, you catch the thread guide that's just below the tensioner, the three-hole tensioner. Then you come to your tension knob. With your tension knob, you want to make sure that you get that thread between those two tension discs and that you want to actually floss it. Kind of like when you're flossing your teeth and you pop that thread into your teeth, you want to actually feel that thread pop into those tension discs. After the you want to make sure that it's there because if it's not in your tension discs, it's going to cause all kinds of stitch and tension problems. You know, Cheryl, we take calls in the studio uh, from folks who are having troubles. And one of the calls that we often get is someone says, it doesn't matter how much I tighten that tension knob, it doesn't affect my stitch. What's their problem when that happens? A lot of times what can happen, Brenda, is that they have actually over-tightened that knob and they have tightened it down so tight that no matter how hard they pull that thread, it's actually still going to lay on the top. Or it was all tight and they never got it flossed in at all. And so no matter what they do the knob, it's not affecting that thread, is it? Right. So what we recommend if that knob is tightened, we recommend that they back it off, turning it to the left for Lefty Lucy, about six full revolutions, and then restart trying to set their tension. You know, this just feels kind of strange to me because my home ec teacher told me not to fiddle with that dial. I know, and we hear that all the time. Don't set, don't touch your tension. It's already preset in the factory. Well, back in the olden days when we were younger, <laughs> that might have been the case because we only sewed with two or three threads. We didn't have all these different threads that we used. And so now we've got all these different threads. And so all of these different threads take a different type of tension. And so we need to be comfortable adjusting our tension. Got it. OK, after we are into the tension knob, then we want to be able to catch that spring. Then we go under the, under the stirrup. Oh, should I point out the stirrup? That would be a good idea. So here's the spring, and here's the stirrup. You know that you've caught that spring if you pull on that thread slightly, and you can see that spring actually move. After the stirrup, you go to the thread uptake lever. Every once in a while in retreat, Brenda, we'll have somebody say, my bobbin thread won't pick up. My bobbin thread won't pick up. And invariably, they've skipped 
that thread uptake lever because it is a hard thing to see because of our handlebars. So you've got to make sure that that's one spot that you don't skip. Okay, got it. So after the thread uptake, there is actually one more spot on the side of the machine before we come to the hole in the front. I don't think I got it in my photograph, Cheryl. Can you kind of explain where it is? If you look right there behind the fingers that are in the pictures, there is a little loop there, and you just put the thread through there. Okay. After there, it goes down into the front. At the bottom of the needle bar, there is actually a hole in the front, and you want to make sure that you don't skip that hole because that is actually a tension guide, a thread guide there for that. After there, I think go. that's the hardest one to thread. It is because you always have a tendency to want to go straight, and this actually goes in at an angle. Got it. And so then after the hole in the front, then you go down to your needle, and you thread your needle from front to back. Okay, so that's the, the normal kind of threads that I'm going to use for quilting everyday quilts. But what about when I'm using these special threads? Some of them are really delicate, and they are prone to breaking. What can I do to help keep them from breaking? Well, the first thing that you're going to do is you're not going to be afraid to adjust your tension. And with these threads, because they're a delicate thread, they are going to take less tension. And so you've got to loosen your tension. Take a look at the picture we've got here. We've got several different examples of delicate threads. you want to tell us about some of those? We do. We have a glitter thread, which is a flat mylar ribbon, a holographic ribbon. It reminds me of Christmas tinsel on the tree. Do you remember that kind of tinsel? Yes, I do, and it does look like that. It's also the, um, the mylar balloons. Oh, yeah. It kind of reminds me of those, only in long, skinny little strips. And, and the biggest thing to know about that kind of thread is it's flat instead of a round kind of thread, right? It is flat. Then we have our monofilament, which is our clear threads. It comes in monopoly or it comes in a nylon. Okay. And then our other two threads there are both uh, metallic thread. They're a polyester wrapped thread. I thought this one might have been a rayon, but whether it is or not, rayon threads can be a special uh, problem, too, because they're very delicate. Okay. The, the metallic thread is actually a poly core wrapped with the metallic. Ah, okay. In, a, in any case, they can be kind of tricky, and a lot of people are afraid of them. They can, but they're a lot of fun on your quilts. I noticed in this picture that uh, most of these are on spools instead of a cone. There's one on the cone on the left, but most of these are on spools. They are. Oops. Oh, I got lost along the way here. Hold on, folks. I've got to catch this back up. You want to tell them a joke, Cheryl? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, folks. He hit the uh, go to the top of the display here. So close your eyes so I won't make you dizzy. And I'm still not there. Back up. One more. There we are. We're back. Thank you. <laughs> Next time, you get to run the mouse. And then you get to do the talking, okay. right? <laughs> okay. When using the delicate threads, we actually have an accessory for our handy quilting machines. It's called a horizontal spool pin. It sits on top of your machine, and that way your spool will wind off the way that it should instead of twisting as it comes off the top. I think our next picture shows us. Yeah, and before we go to the next picture, I want to mention that this is way up in the front of the machine, so we're no longer bringing a thread through the thread mast or that thread guide that's on the back, right? Correct. With this thread, all you're going to do is you're going to go from the horizontal spool pin, you're going to thread it through one hole of the three-hole tension guide, and it does not matter which hole, but you want to make sure that you go from back to front, and then you continue on your thread path. You don't worry about anything at the back of the machine. That's a good point. You know, every time thread goes through a thread guide, it puts a little bit of tension on the thread. And so with a delicate thread, that's why we like to start up front. In addition to the fact that it's a horizontal spool pin, 
it avoids a couple of thread guides and there's less tension. And that's why you're only putting it through one hole, too. That's right. Oh, it's the toilet paper it example. It is the toilet paper. We want our glitter thread to sit on our horizontal spool pin and roll off like a roll of toilet paper. It doesn't matter whether it rolls off from the back or the front, but that way it keeps it from twisting. If we were to take, like on our next slide, I think, and set our spool on the spool pin at the back of the machine, it would be sitting upright, and then as you pull that off, it's going to twist just like our toilet paper is here in our picture. And once that twist hits the tension discs, it's going to break. So we want to turn it sideways on the horizontal spool pin so that we don't have any twisting in that thread. Got it. And on the other threads that we were talking about earlier, they're stronger, so they can handle the twisting. Plus, the three-hole pretensioner helps to take some of the twist out of threads again, doesn't it? It does. So that's the top of the machine, but I hear you gals in the studio talk about bob and tension, bob and tension, bob and tension. So here we go. Let's talk about adjusting our tension. Well, Brenda, you do know that the bobbin is actually the foundation, just like when you start building a house. You don't start at the roof. You and start with the bottom or oh, the foundation. Okay. So always remember that your bobbin is the foundation of your tension. So it's pretty important. It is. And I bet it's even important how that bobbin gets wound. It is. In this picture, we've got a bobbin that is spongy or too soft, and it's not going to um, roll off properly, and so it's going to cause snarling and jamming as it's coming out of there. You know, I've, I've seen a bobbin that got wound too loosely before, and when you pull on the thread, it buries itself in there. It does. And so rather than throwing this thread away and figuring that it's just a waste, take it, put it in a quart jar, I'll buy this um, bobbin winder, and rewind the thread onto a new bobbin. Oh, great idea. Can you wind a bobbin too tight? Oh, you can, especially if you're using a delicate thread. Some of the delicate threads are actually stretchy, and so you start winding it at a fast speed on the bobbin winder, and it will actually expand the sides of the wall, the bobbin case wall, or the bobbin walls, and then the bobbin doesn't fit into our bobbin case. I think the next picture shows you. See the gold thread there? That bobbin has been expanded, and it's too full. And so the best thing to do is to just take that thread and wind it onto another bobbin and throw that bobbin away because it's not going to work and you don't want to get it mixed up in your good bobbins. I've even heard stories about domestic machines that use plastic bobbins that they've exploded. I actually had that happen one day. Did you? I was kind of shocked. <laughs> so I don't think our aluminum bobbins are going to explode, but they can expand too much. And then think about it, that bobbin case is the perfect fit for your bobbin, and if the bobbin all of a sudden is bigger, deeper, it's not going to stitch properly. That's correct. So you want to make sure that you don't overfill it. So the first place that we start with our bobbin case is we want to start in our bobbin, and we want to make sure that our bobbins are in proper working order. And so one of the things that we do is we need to make sure that our bobbins are clean. We need to remember that once we set our bobbin case tension, then our adjustments are going to be on the top. It's a lot easier to make adjustments on the top than having to keep crawling under that quilt to pull that bobbin in and out. And, and does the weight of the thread make any difference when you're adjusting the tension in that bobbin case? It does. Your lighter threads will need a lighter tension in the top and the bobbin. And some of our more delicate threads, we actually even recommend that you loosen your tension even a little bit more. Okay. You want to make sure that your bobbin case is clean, and some of the threads that people use are a little more linty than other threads, and so you want to make sure that you keep the lint cleaned out of your bobbin case area. That's why we recommend long staple threads, threads that are made from long staple fibers. They don't break off and lint as badly as short staple fibers do. That's true. So you want to make sure that you clean the inside of your bobbin case. There's actually a little spring area in there that you need to very, very gently clean under and make sure that it's clean. 
And, you know, some people see that little piece of metal in there and they think, what is that for? But I know the answer to that question. Okay, what is the answer? It, it gently holds the bobbin up against inside the machine. So it, it just puts a little bit of pressure on the, on the bobbin. And it's important that it be in there. And it keeps the bobbin from spinning and getting backlash, which can be a problem. So if that was not set properly, then that would be a problem. So that's nice to know. So if, I've, if we've got um, stitching that indicates a backlash, you might want to take a look at that tension string inside and make sure that's set properly. That's good to know. The other place that you can check your bobbin case is the little tension finger. Sometimes if you're using a linty thread, it can actually build up under there, and it gets really hard. And so if you've got that lint ball under there, it's not going to let you set the proper tension. It actually holds that arm up, and so you will never get a proper tension. The way that we recommend cleaning it out is either by using a pin or a business card and actually slide it under there and get that little chunk of lint out of it. The thing that you've got to be careful about is on the outside of the bobbin case, there is actually a little slot. And if you pull that arm up too far, it can pop out and land on the outside of your bobbin case. You want to make sure that that little area goes back into the slot on the side. Because if it's out, there's no tension on your thread, right? That is right. And when you're putting your bobbin into a bobbin case and you brought it up to the slit, it also went underneath this tension finger. And that's what, that's the adjustment we're going to be making is on that tension finger. It is. So one thing that I did repeatedly when I first got my machine was I put my bobbin in backwards. And then guess what? It doesn't stitch right, does it? <laughs> That's right. It took me a long time to figure out why and what I was doing wrong. So is there a trick for remembering how to put that in? You want to make sure that when you're putting your bobbin case, your bobbin into your bobbin case, that as you pull that thread, your bobbin rotates clockwise. The easiest way for me to think of it is I hold my bobbin case in my left hand and I hold my bobbin in my right hand and I hold my bobbin up and it actually makes a number nine with that thread coming across the top and down on the right hand side. That is the best tip I've ever heard. So then you take your bobbin and you put it into your bobbin case and you put it through the slot and under that spring arm, and then you want to check your tension. You always want to check your tension with a full bobbin because that weight of the full bobbin gives you a proper measurement for your tension. I also know that I've got the bobbin incorrectly. When I pull that thread off to the left, then my bobbin's going the other way. That's right. That's a good tip. So how are we going to check bobbin case tension? The easiest way to check your bobbin case tension is by using a drop test. We recommend that you hold the bobbin case in your hand with your bobbin side facing up because if you have the bobbin side facing down and you try to lift that up, all that's going to happen is that bobbin is going to fall out. So you want to face your bobbin up and then you're going to grab the thread and you want to try and lift it off your hand. In this picture, it's too tight because it's not falling back down. You want to be able to have that bobbin stand up in your hand, and as you move your hand away, the bobbin case will gently slide down like a spider crawling down its web. So when I picked the photo for this, Cheryl, I thought this was showing perfect tension, but I guess we really can't tell if it's just sitting there or if it's sliding, can we? That's true. Unless we saw it moving, we wouldn't know for sure. And so I'm going to put a plug in here for the video that we've created. At the end of this webinar, we're going to give you a link to a, a, a video that covers all of the information Cheryl and I are talking about today, but you'll be able to see it with moving pictures. We couldn't do movies on this webinar because uh, they don't come across very well. You get a kind of a herky-jerky movie, but you'll be able to watch it on YouTube, and you could watch it any time of day or night, even in your pajamas. And I actually watched that this morning, and it was very good. Great. So perfect tension would be when you lift it off your hand and it gently falls back to your hand like a spider crawling down its web. Do I need to kind of wiggle my hand to get that to go? You don't want to wiggle your hand or bounce it at all. You want to be able to just lift it up 
and have it fall back down without any bouncing or jiggling from your hand. I don't know this sounds too easy, Cheryl. Are you sure it's this simple? It is this simple. So what if I pick up that bobbin case and it doesn't fall down? Look, I used the same picture. <laughs> How do you know? I don't know. So I think in this case that bobbin is just hanging there above my hand. What's that an indication of? That means that your tension is too tight and it's going to cause all kinds of problems. Your thread will probably break because your bobbin is too tight, so you need to make some adjustments to that bobbin case. So I'm going to have to loosen it, aren't I? You are going to have to loosen it. And remember that if it won't lift off of your hand at all, it's too loose. You want it to be able to stand up in your hand and be able to just drop down like a spider on a spider web. So if I've got that bobbin case sitting in my hand and I try to lift it using the thread and it just spins in the case, it's too loose, huh? Correct. Okay. And then I'm going to be tightening it, right? You are. Okay. So how am I going to make those adjustments? You told me I have to loosen it in one case, tighten it in another. How do I do that? Okay, Brenda, if you look at your bobbin case, there are actually two screws on the bobbin case. The top one closest to where the thread comes out actually has a little ring around it. And that is the screw that you're going to adjust. And what you're actually adjusting is that arm that goes over top of your thread. I can see the thread over here poking out. So when you're going to loosen or tighten this screw, it affects this whole finger and it puts more or less pressure on that thread, right? Correct. And remember, your adjustments on the bobbin case are very, very slight, like the tick of a clock. Righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. Minute adjustments. Very, very small. So I've got this in my hand, and I make a tiny little adjustment with the screwdriver. And then the next step is to do what? Then you're going to start all over again with your drop test. And once you've got that perfect tension, with the spider crawling down its web, you know that you finally got your bobbin set properly. Great. You know, I've noticed, Cheryl, when you do videos with us, that it never works. It doesn't. It never works. It only works at home, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. The what? minute we put a camera on us, we have trouble too, don't we? That's right. <laughs> One other thing that I want to mention is with the bobbin case, when you put your bobbin case into your machine, you don't want to hold that little lever open. You want to leave that lever shut and put that bobbin case into your machine and hear that little snap, knowing that your bobbin is seated properly in the machine. You're talking about that little latch that I use. I poke my finger, my fingernail under it to pull it out. I should not have it out when I put, go back in? Right. You want to leave that down because then your bobbin will sit properly in the hook mechanism. I'll bet that's news to a lot of people because it's such a handy little handle. It is. So how do I hang on to that bobbin case to, go, to put it in the machine? The easiest thing that I found is that I make sure that I, as I go to put it in my hook area, I have a kind of slanted backwards so that that bobbin isn't falling out. Oh, good tip. So, Okay, so we've got our bobbin case back in, and we think our bobbin tension is set perfectly. It is set perfectly. Okay, thanks. That's because you did it, right? That's right. Actually, it's everybody can do it perfectly. It's easy to do. It is. So then what's the next step? Then the next step is we are going to actually be working now with our top tension. Once our bobbin is set, which is the foundation, mm -hmm. then our adjustments are going to be on the top. So am I going to jump right to the quilt that I'm working oh, on? Oh, I wouldn't. I want to check and make sure that my tension is set properly first. I like to do that by either using a quilt sandwich that's made out of the same type of fabric and the same batting, mm -hmm. or else because we tell people to have three to four inches of extra space on their back, they can actually take a little piece of fabric and lay it on that edge and actually quilt right there on the edge of their Quilt. That's a great idea, especially if you've got a, a quilt that's so wide it fills up all of your frame. Right? right. So here's what I'm looking for, right? That's right. You want balanced stitches. You want to make sure that each of your stitches goes into the quilt and you can see the formation of the stitch, top and bottom, so that they're nice and balanced. 
Here's a little diagram we like to use when we're teaching this in our retreats here at Handy Quilter. It is. This shows on the on diagram A, our top thread is too tight because all it's doing is laying there. I like to think of it as a tug of war. Those two threads should actually meet right in the middle. And if one is winning over the other, that one is the stronger thread and it's pulling the other one too far. So if I have my bobbin thread showing up on the top, like diagram A, I need to loosen my top thread so that those bobbin threads will sink back down in the middle. So that the tug of war is equal. They meet in the middle. Correct. Now, here's a question for you, Cheryl, because I hear a lot of quilters looking at diagram A, and they understand, okay, my thread's on top. It looks like it's too tight. So some people think, well, then I need to tighten my bobbin tension. What's wrong with that? But remember, we set our bobbin first, and once our bobbin set correctly, then our adjustments are going to be the top, on the top, which are a lot easier to make than on the bobbin. I like that idea. And you know it's scientific, too. When you think about doing experiments, you only want to change one variable at a time. So if we have our bobbin tension set correctly, and we know it's right, then the only variable is that top tension. And that's the one we mess with, right? That's right. And it's also easier to get to. Good point. So here's some other stitches that um, we made these on purpose, right? Yes, we did. OK. So what's wrong with the ones that we're pointing to with that little screwdriver? If you look at these stitches, they are actually laying on top. It looks like it's just kind of flat there. You don't see a well-defined stitch. I can see well-defined stitches in the row above. Right. But in the row that the little screwdriver is pointing to, that thread is just laying on the top of the fabric. It's because the top tension is too tight and it's pulling that bobbin tension up, bobbin thread up to the top of the quilt. Got it. So you need to loosen your top tension. So here's the tension knob on our machine and we've flossed our thread in those tension discs behind the knob. Um, on the handy quilter machine, that knob is black and there's a raised dot. We put a drop of white paint on there so we can see it in the photograph. And I actually encourage everybody who owns this machine to do that themselves. It helps you keep track of where that dot is. That's a good idea because a lot of times when people make those adjustments on the top, they're really afraid to move it. And so they just barely move it. And you're not going to see adjustments to your, bob your, to your tension on the top until you make at least usually a full revolution of that dot, meaning that it's right there at 11 o'clock. You turn it all the way around until it's back to 11 o'clock again. So all the way back would be one full revolution, and that's not too much? No, that's not. Sometimes that's not even enough. OK. So that's very different from our domestic machines, isn't it? It is. And it's also different from the bobbin case, because remember, the bobbin case adjustments are very minute. You know, Cheryl, I get a lot of questions from our owners asking us why we don't have numbers on this knob. They're used to numbers on their domestic machine, but I think I know the answer based on your recommendation here. Numbers don't do you much good because we're not just, we're not just clicking it through a couple numbers. We're doing whole revolutions. So you just need to keep track of how many revolutions you make, a half or a whole, right? That's right. So that's what that dot would do. Yes, it would. OK. So we were going to loosen this tension, and so you had us turn it uh, a revolution to the left. Correct. And here I think we're just reminding them that you could do half or whole turns of that knob. So I'm going to move on. Okay. And now I've got a different kind of stitch. These stitches are too loose. There's no tension on those. There's no tension on this. And your top thread is really loose. I've got a view of that from the back side too. Oh, that's really bad tension. See those eyelashes? That means your top tension is really loose, and it's losing that tug of war. So you need to go back and tighten your top tension. Remember, righty tighty. So you're going to turn that knob at least with this much eyelashing. I would probably turn it two full revolutions before I even checked it okay. again. You know, I think it's important to remember, too, that we're talking about full and half revolutions, but sometimes you're so close it might only take a quarter of a turn, right? That's right. 
So here's a thread nest on the bottom of the quilt. If I have this, what would your first thought be? My first thought would be that the thread is not flossed into the tension dial. And so I would go back and check and make sure that my floss was my thread was flossed. Okay. Now before we go on to this slide, we've got a question from one of our uh, viewers today, and she's asking. How do I get perfect tension with two different colors of thread, one color on the bottom and one color on the top? Well, Brenda, you can have a balanced stitch and have it meeting in the middle, but because of the contrast in the colors, you may still see that little pin dot of color. One of the easiest ways to avoid that is to use the same color of thread in your top and in your bobbin. Okay, so you would advise me to match my bobbin color my bobbin thread color to the top or to the bottom of my quilt? To the top of your quilt because your back isn't going to be seen as much as your top. Or really what we're saying is match it to your top thread, right? That's right. Okay. So now you've taught me how to do, to set my bobbin tension perfectly, how to adjust my top tension so I get that nice balanced stitch that the tug of war um, meets perfectly in the middle. But what happens if everything seems perfect and I've checked and checked, but my thread still breaks? Do you have a secret? We do. And what happens with that is a lot of times your tension is set too tight in both your bobbin and your top thread. So the best thing to do is to start once again with your bobbin, loosen your bobbin tension, and then readjust your top tension. That way you can get back to that balanced stitch and be able to quilt without your thread breaking. You know, this reminds me of your toilet paper again. If you think about that tug of war and you've got people on both sides of your tug of war and they're pulling on a big heavy rope, you would have really tight tension on both sides, right? Right. And that rope would not break. Correct. But what if those same two teams were pulling really hard on a roll of toilet paper? I think it would break pretty quickly. So then the answer would be, even though they're balanced, what would they have to do? They would have to loosen both the top tension and the bottom tension. I think this is the best tip of the day. To know that I can set my tension perfectly and have a balanced stitch, but still have breaking stitches, sometimes I just have to loosen up. That's right. Okay. So I want to thank everybody for coming today. I hope you've learned a, a bit about your machine and feel more confident. I want to tell you that here at Handy Quilter, we host over 20 retreats a year, and we'd like to invite you to come. Just uh, come to handyquilter.com, click on the Education tab, and then click on the Retreat tab, and you can learn all about our retreats. We cover this topic as well as lots of other topics. We'd love to have you come. We have placed the TNT video on our website, and you can find it at handyquilter.com backslash TNT video. So it's going to be there forever. So if you can't remember everything Cheryl taught you today, you can go back there. And then tell your friends who had to miss the webinar today that we're recording this. Mistakes at all, Cheryl. I'm sorry. And we're going to have that also on the Handy Coder website under the Education tab. I don't see any other questions from our viewers, so I'm going to tell everybody goodbye. And thank you so much for coming. We'll see you again in a month. We plan to do these every month, and we will send your invitation uh, via an email newsletter. So if you'd like to get that invitation, <coughs> excuse me, make sure you come to handycooler.com and sign up for our email newsletter. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Brenda.